Welcome to the Elite Performance Team Podcast. Dominic Perillo and Dr. Jan Kasperitz produce podcasts weekly with information in health and wellness, as well as guests on our podcast. If this is your first time listening, thanks for listening. If you like our content, you can find more information on Facebook or subscribe to us on YouTube and iTunes. Today we have Chuck Schneckloff, a school teacher, runner, and run coach. And also he brought an entourage. This is entourage. His second, second time. Second time we have an entourage. It's always runners, the entourages. We have Jason Tomachko with us. The Chuck. Jason Tomachko. <laughs> Chuck, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I was born and raised in New Jersey. And uh, after my first master's degree, I moved out to California. I moved up to the West Coast for a decade. Um, did some teaching, did some running, did some coaching out there. And in 2010, I moved back to New Jersey, founded the Garden State Track Club, and over the last 10 years, I've just had a great time meeting, meeting runners in the area and, and, and building a coalition of people who like the sport, uh, one of them being uh, our master's captain here, Jason Tomochko. Jay, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm also born and raised in New Jersey, and uh, was not a runner at all in my life until about seven years ago. Started running just to lose weight, found out that I was uh, pretty fast and competitive, and uh, I guess about four years ago, Chuck messaged me on Facebook and convinced me to join the Garden State Track Club, which I did, and uh, I just fell in love with the club and became a big part of my life and have been running and competing with them for the past four years. And recently became the Masters captain. And Jason's son was actually on, on uh, there was a little video on him at the, at the games. Uh, was that two weeks ago? Yeah, he, he had a really good race at the Millrose games. That's awesome. We'll start with a quote of the day. Quote of the day, a short run is better than no run. Doc, what do you think about that? Uh, I think it's fantastic. You gotta get it in. You gotta find. You can't find time. You gotta make time every single day to get uh, get you to towards your goal. Uh, like Mark Williams, I think he's up to almost like thirty two hundred days in a row. I just saw. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, so I think great quote. Good quote, Tom. Chuck, how about you? What do you think about that quote? Uh, well, you know, I uh, one of the things I preach to my athletes is 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 I mean, as a post collegiate or as athletes who have graduated high school, graduated college, and life gets in the way, and family, and friends, and job. Obviously, waking up at 4.30 in the morning, or running at 8, 8 p.m. at night, sometimes you just have to do it. Um, but, you know, I think the other, the other end of that uh, perspective, though, is sometimes it is worth taking a day of rest. Sometimes it is worth um, deciding, you know what, it's better to just have a good meal, get good sleep, and you know, come back the next day and, and, and find time. So I can see both sides. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Jay, what about you? Yeah, I, I've done both. I, I do periods of, of long periods of running without rest, um, but I'm currently coming back from injury and I'm, I'm in a cycle where I need that one day off a week just to let my body kind of recover. And, uh, you know, I think if you have any strict rules that you follow without considering circumstances, they could be detrimental. Yeah, I agree. I find sometimes my shorter runs to be much more enjoyable because they're short. Right? You just get it, get out there, you have 30 minutes back home, it's quick, it's easy. So sometimes those are a lot more, um, I don't know, fun, I guess, would be. Some of these long ones just get really, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they become a drag. You guys know. Yeah. So, uh, Chuck, you ran for Rutgers. I did. Uh, Tell us about ago. Um, well, I actually, uh, I was actually on the soccer team my first year at Rutgers, and uh, I just, it just wasn't, the, the team vibe really wasn't uh, what I was hoping it would be. So I walked onto the track team my sophomore year, uh, made it, and uh, the next four years ran the 800 and uh, led off a few distance medleys in the 1200, ran cross country, and. Um, you know, it was, you know, it's funny, I, I, I talk to friends now who talk about what they did in college and, and, you know, they studied abroad or they, you know, they just did all these interesting things and, and all I did was just run to some degree, you know, like you've got, if you're going to go to meets all, all Saturday or if you're going to have, uh, you know, 
early morning, Saturday morning workouts, you can't do anything on Friday, you can't do anything on Sunday, so I would just study on Friday nights. And you know, sometimes I think back and I think, gosh, it would have been nice to have had a more full uh, college experience, but at the same time, um, you know, I, I think I was the kind of kid that needed the structure and needed the kind of community and the support of, of teammates. So, you know, it kept me out of trouble and certainly got an opportunity to see all different parts of the world that I would never have seen probably if I wasn't on the track team. Um, and, you know, I probably wouldn't be here now if I didn't put in the commitment and the time to, uh, you know, really try to be the best runner I could be when I was in college. Did you run in tra uh, track in high school too? <clears throat> I did, yeah. I ran at Matushan High School uh, for, for three years. Um, and uh, very, very great program under under uh, Coach Marty Holleran. Um, we won uh, a state title my senior year in the spring, and that certainly motivated, I mean, it really helped me uh, fall in love with the sport. Um, but at the same time, I, I was one of those guys that thought soccer was gonna be the way to go, um, and I just kind of saw track as something that was a nice supplement to my soccer training. Um, but, you know, we evolve and we change, and, um, you know, I don't regret uh, for a second, the decision to change sports and you know pursue pursue running. Sure. Did you run the same distances in high school as you did in college? Not really. No, I didn't run cross country in in college uh, and running cross country in high school. Sorry, uh, and running cross country in college really made a big difference on the track. I mean, I played soccer all fall in when I was in high school, and then I would just do indoor and outdoor. But doing cross country uh, all um, uh, all fall, it just it just made running the 800 so much easier. It made running the mile so much easier. Like there was so much more of an aerobic base. And it was almost like a, it wasn't, it was no longer a sport. It was now kind of a lifestyle. You know, like if you do it year round, not like, well, I guess it's time to do track. You know, it was something I did 24 seven all year. So um, that really did, I think, make a difference in terms of my mindset and how I, um, kind of how I approached you know, the, the sport is an athlete. You won some medals there in Rutgers? Well, um, there's not a whole lot of medals to be won in college. Um, uh, but but I, I, I have four. Um, I, I was on four relays that were all Big East, four by eights and distance medleys. So they're somewhere in some box. But, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, you go at a road race and kind of everybody gets medals. But yeah, I mean, the most competitive running out there um, it's just not really a thing, you know. So uh, my wife always asks about them, and I, I can't, right now I can't find them. I know they're somewhere, um, but yeah, I think we were. I think the best. I think the best we did was like fourth or fifth, and in, in a four by eight back in the nineties. We have some patients that chase medals. Yeah. They drive to Ohio to do a five k <laughs> because yeah. it gives them big a medal. medal. Yeah. Yeah. And some of those medals you can't blame them. Uh, you know, they're nice medals. Fancy. Yeah, they are worth driving for. But for sure. Yeah. You know, speaking of medals, I I, uh, I have a new appreciation for medals, having designed the medals for the Garden State Ten Miler, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if you've seen the medal design that we posted online. You are artistically inclined, Jason. It, yeah. it, it's pretty amazing. We have a diner theme this year because every yeah. the race is all themed around New Jersey. Perfect. And we had, we uh, we did uh, diner medals, and for the Challenger medal, we have um, the jukebox, diner jukebox. Yes. Yeah, pretty pretty cool stuff. Really came out like the little, little ones you like put the quarter in at the table, yeah. right? Exactly the little buttons yeah. for different, different songs. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. So Chuck, when you went out west, you coached in Oregon. Yeah. Uh, so my intention was to. It was 1990. It was 2000. The Olympic trials were in 2004 in Sacramento. Uh, my vision for my whole plan here was. I was going to qualify for the Olympic trials in the 800. I was only a few seconds away, and that would be easy to do while I was coaching and teaching. But you know, I was 24. I didn't know a whole lot back then. So um, training at the level that I was doing in college was really challenging, especially on the Oregon coast, where it rains almost every day there. Um, but I did. Uh, I, co I taught and coached at a seaside high school, small little town, um, right near Astoria, which is where Goonies was filmed. Um, and uh, it was it was a great it was a great two years, but uh, you know there was nobody my age. The, the, the weather was just awful for running, so I uh, 
I left after two years and went down to the Bay Area. You won Coach of the Year there, didn't you? Yeah, so 2001 um, uh, was my first year being a head coach there. And the year before, they were like a 500 team or whatever. But, you know, it was just one of those, it was one of those things where the right kids were there, and I got a couple more right kids to come out. And, you know, I was the, the novelty 24-year-old coach. And um, we won the, the 3A state title at Hayward Field by three and a half points. And um, a week later, my AD comes in and says, you were just, <laughs> you were just voted the coach of the year for the, you know. Uh, and evidently, um, he, he told me this, I've never verified it, but he told me I was the youngest in, uh, in, this, in the state history of, of track and field, I don't know about the other sports, to have been, to have been gotten that, uh, that award. So it was, it was really cool. Got, you know, had the banquet and brought a couple kids with me. Um, but uh, that was not enough to keep me there. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a great, it was a great time there, and we, we, we had some really great um, team uh, team performances. But you know, I, I for my own sanity, I needed to uh, to leave the Oregon Coast. And then you went to California. So I went, yeah. So I went down to the Bay Area in 2002 because, again, the trials were in Sacramento in 2004. So I was like, okay, I need to I need to go to some warmer climate. I need to go where there's people training at this type, this, at the, the level that I was looking for, um, and I just needed to be close to the action. And uh, unfortunately, my first, my first year there is when I, I first had a, a micro tear of my Achilles tendon, and for like 2002 to 2005, I barely did any running. Um, but I did a lot of coaching, and I did a lot of teaching, and um, that was a lot of fun. So I don't, uh, I don't regret that at all either. How was it coming back to running after the micro tear? Because that could be that, that could be a long time. It was really hard. Yeah. Um, I tried everything. Yeah. I spent so much money out of pocket. I mean, I as a teacher, I had good good health insurance, but I just tried deep tissue massage, like all these things that just uh, you know. Uh, I tried I tried everything, um, but finally I I got custom orthotics done, and the next day I was running. It was it was incredible. So um, I mean, I had gained some weight, and it took some time to, to get back into things. And uh, I ended up joining uh, the West Valley Track Club, which was um, uh, which meets out in uh, San, in San Francisco, and that really um, that was a really nice way to kind of get myself back into the sport. Um, but at that point, like my 800, you know, the the 800 window to some degree had closed. I was 27, 28, so I kind of started doing 5Ks and at marathons and, you know, brings us back to what you were saying about how terrible, you know, 16 mile runs can be sometimes, but, um, but I, I continue to coach and I continue to teach and, um, you know, the Bay Area is just a beautiful area and it's just such a great place for active people, be it runners or bikers or whatever. So it was an incredible, incredible time, but uh, unfortunately the idea of like qualifying for the 2008 Olympic trials, there was just no way. So that's that. So that's slight shift in biomechanics on your foot alleviated your issues almost immediately? <clears throat> well, you know, I'm, I'm no doctor, so for all I know, it may have, you know, it may have been a, a couple different things that sure. ended up leading to it, but, you know, the week before I was in, I had mild pain walking, and I put those suckers in, and it was like I had a new lease on life. That's awesome. it, was, it was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, 2010, you founded the Garden State Track Club. I did. So uh, I had just come back from I've just come back from California. In the Bay Area, the running scene there is just incredible. I mean, everybody of all ages, of all abilities, joins running clubs. Like it's just a thing that you do. And when I came back to New Jersey in 2010, I was super excited to get plugged into a community. I mean, I, I obviously didn't know much about run, running clubs when I was in. When I was in college, but when I was when I came back, I just assumed well, it's going to be like it was in California. Uh, however, it totally wasn't. <laughs> um, I went around to all these different clubs. Um, I emailed them. I actually went to some team runs. I, I get it, got as much information as I could, and um, there really wasn't anything that I was looking for. I mean, I was kind of looking for something a little younger, a little more dynamic, a little more, you know, people really trying to to get PRs and. Um, but it was, by and large, most of the, the, the running groups that I had talked to were mostly older masters runners. It was kind of a recreational thing, and 
they, I mean, like, yeah, they, they were super nice people, and it was really great getting to know all them, but it just wasn't what I wanted in a, in a running community. So, um, you know, I just remember one night just kind of thinking about, well, what do I do? Like, how do I, how do I make friends? I don't go out to bars. Like, you know, I've got a few friends teaching, but how do I meet runners who I, the p types of people who I like to hang out with? So I just decided, well, maybe I'll just start my own club and see what happens. Um, I had no idea what that meant, and I certainly, I'm not sure if I would have done it now, knowing everything that I know now, but um, you know, it's, um, it's been a really interesting 10 years of uh, you know, building, um, uh, building a group of people who just love the sport. How many members do you have? Uh, well over a thousand. Like, yeah, I remember like three years ago noticing the, the, the gold and black. I was like, whoa, these guys are legit. They got some legit funders on the team. Like, oh, now a lot of people that I'm working with are also now on the team, too. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I noticed that, too. There's a lot of, um, Leon is a pretty good track club, too, but the majority of them, exactly what you were saying, very recreational. They just want support with their running. And um, I think uh, the one group we work with, I think they have like three, just a little, little bit more than 300 members. But whenever there's like a running event, maybe the same five or six people only show up. Right. Yeah. So they're either part of the group, but they're not actually active at all, at all part of it. Or as I've noticed, some people they're part of every single run group. They just want to be part of every single run group, but they're not actually involved with anything. So that's great. Yeah, and I and I think that's what draw drew in somebody like Jason. I mean, Jason's the kind of person I'll, I don't want to speak for you, but you know, I think he's the kind of guy that. You know, he wants he wants to get better. He wants to go to team practices. He wants to go to events where there's a team to warm up with and to cool down with and the, and, and and to race with. And um, like you know, to your point, there's really a big difference between hey, like let's just meet on a Sunday and let's run a few miles versus hey, let's meet on a track on a Saturday. Let's crush some intervals because next week we've got a really big team event and we want to do really well. Yeah, yeah. and. Something I really find special about the club is just how diverse it is. Um, you know, I, I really enjoy going to races and getting to know some of the younger runners, and sometimes seeing them on TV and national meets is is really really huge because it's like, ah, oh, this is the guy that I cool down with after the the Geralda 10K, uh, and then you know seeing the track and field group who I don't really get to know that well, but but you know getting to watch him race in Miller's games. That really, that diversity is something that I really appreciate about the club. It's probably my favorite part. Yeah, and you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think when the question's asked, well, how many people do you have on the club? I think typically we're thinking like, well, how many distance runners are out running marathons, right? Uh, how many people are showing up to the local 5K and running? Um, but the one big thing that really separates our group, one of many things, from other groups is that we do have this track component. Track and field is extremely challenging and tricky after college. Uh, I mean, people have jobs, people have lives and, and families, and you know, track is one of those things where you just kind of can't do it on your own. Like, you need teammates, you need a coach, you need a facility, and um, you know, track is the type of sport that really does attract a very diverse group of, of athletes. And you know, for our women to break the four by two. Uh, meet record at the Milrose Games for our men's 4x2 to, to win the gold medal um, last year's uh, Milrose Games 4x2. You know, most clubs don't even, you know, that's not even on the radar. And this is something that we not only care about, but we, we support and we do invest a good amount of resources and time trying to not just develop our, our marathoners, but, you know, these other types of athletes who who are just as dedicated, just as hardworking, and to some degree, just as high achieving as you know what you see out on the roads. Yeah, everybody talks about the marathon as the race, but it's like, me and Jay's have, have had this discussion before. I know I think doing the mile is the one to do. I mean, if you want to really suffer, if you want to like, put it all out there, <laughs> go run a mile as fast as you can. But the other question, too, I had is, are you guys throughout the entire state, all the way from North Jersey up here where Jason is, all the way down to South Jersey as well? So, one of the growing pains that we had years ago was, you know, we created this model um, that a lot of people were excited about, right? And, and I don't think it's something that you can just kind of uh, 
know, cookie cutter and just some other group can, sure. you know, like we just kind of had this unique model that, that just really drew in a lot of people. And we had this issue of like, okay, what happens if there's people from Philly? What happens if there's people from New York City and there's pe people from Easton, Pennsylvania? Like, we have members all over the tri-state area. So what we've done is we've, we've created this enclave system. I think we have 13 or 14 enclaves now. So there are these little um, pods of, of groups throughout the tri-state area, and we have captains or leaders for each one of those enclaves, and they're kind of the ones who uh, organize the runs, they're the ones who communicate with the people there, and they're kind of the ones that are, are the glue that brings people together. Um, and then when we have team events or team races or team functions, that's when you'll see all these different enclaves kind of coming together. Uh, but that, that has been a challenge because, you know, uh, how do you support this really wide spectrum of, of people with different needs from the beach to Philly to, you know, so it is, it is challenging, but I also think, and, and I think Jason's really good at doing this, is um, you don't need to be next down the street from someone to feel like you're close to them. And I think social media, and I think, um, uh, and I think just communication with the, with the text messages and emails that someone like a, a captain like Jason will do really makes people feel like, hey, they're 60 miles away from me, but I still feel the intimacy that I would feel like they're on my same college campus, and we're all going to meet at the track in, in, in two hours. Yeah, I got your email, list, your uh, newsletter this morning. Actually, very comprehensive. It's good. A lot of good content in there too. Oh, right. Huge part of it. Chuck, do you coach um, Eric Holt, a sub four minute mile? So, yeah, so one of the roles I've been very hesitant to play uh, as the managing director of this organization is coaching. Um, we have several people on our, in our club who, who, coach distant, who coach distance races and marathons and 10Ks. Um, I don't particularly like investing a lot of time in the coaching end because it takes a lot of time. <laughs> and if that takes a lot of time, then that means it's drawing me away from doing kind of bigger picture stuff with our, with our club. Um, however, it's, as you can imagine, it's one of the most rewarding things to do is to work one-on-one -on -one with other people, be it fast or slow. And uh, you know, the, the, the coaching part is, has just always been something that I've enjoyed. So, you know, we do have a group that meets in Highland Park uh, three times a week. They're mostly middle distance athletes or sprinters. Um, but then I do coach several other athletes who aren't in the immediate area, um, usually in the middle distances. And, and one of them is Eric Holt. Eric Holt ran, he was a four, 401, 402 guy when he graduated Binghamton. Um, he joined the art club in December last year, and uh, six months later, he. He ran 358.88 and won the Monmouth Mile, and he actually just uh, he actually just competed out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, at the uh, USA Championships in the Mile. He finished ninth, um, and you know he was really amongst the the best of the best out there. So uh, I know he's not thrilled about the outcome, but you know, that's a competitive race, you know. So what was his timing at ninth? You know. Um, so it was a 1500, and it was a very strategic 1500. Okay. So. You know, time kind of goes out the door right, when, uh, right. you know, when guys are going out slow. I mean, it was just one heat. It wasn't like there was trials to a final. So guys just really jogged the first 800, and then it was just a 700 meters of sprinting. So, right. yeah. You co-authored the Diversity Bill in 2019. Tell us about this. Yeah. So, uh, one of the one of the things I love about our club, and I think again, it draws in people like. Jason, is that it's not, our club isn't just about running, right? Like our club isn't just about, uh, you know, getting medals and getting PRs. It's, it's about changing people's lives and it's about changing the sport. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud of in regard to our club is the work that, is the community outreach that we do. Uh, we have now had relationships with seven different inner city schools kind of in the Newark area and we've kind of collected all these gently used uh, running gear and given it and, and given those uh, given that gear to these schools um, because the kids need it you know I mean a lot of kids want to do track but they don't have the money for an entirely new running wardrobe 
and uh, as a former inner city coach in, in East Oakland, I, you know, I, it was one of the things I, I, I recognized right away was kids can't run high tops, you know. Um, so in addition to that initiative, uh, we've also spent a good part of the last year creating a bill um, uh, that, that, that has, implicate, has am implications on the national level of changing how local associations do business. And the majority of the people listening to this probably uh, are asleep at this point, but basically uh, the USATF has small associations. I mean, it's a national organization, and then they have local smaller associations all throughout the country. And those smaller associations are what governs uh, running in those smaller pockets of communities. Um, like any, like any institution or like any uh, place of employment, um, you know, I, I think what ends up happening often is you just kind of get this kind of old boys club that forms, you know, and you just kind of the same folks, kind of, you know thinking the same way and, 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 and standing for the same things. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a challenge, I think, of any organization to try to make sure that you've got all your stakeholders sitting at a table at the same time and making decisions, decisions together, right? Now that's hard because the people who are, if, if there's diversity at the table, it's gonna be hard to agree on things, right? Because you've got all these different perspectives and backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses and, um, so I, I think the easy route to go for any, any institution or organization is to just, hey, let's just bring in the people that we know we're gonna be able to get this done, let's be efficient, let's make the decisions and we're done. The diversity bill uh, has a couple different parts to it, but kind of the overall arching idea is forcing local associations to have, represent, to have a diverse representation at the decision making table. So in other words, just as a really simple example, um, if there's a committee that has two positions where, there's, where they're supposed to be representing women, um, this, this bill is saying we need to fill those with women, right? Um, if there's a committee that has uh, positions open for, for young men between the ages of uh, 19 to 39, um, this bill is saying you've got to have young people representing younger people, right? Because what ends up happening is, well, you know, hey, you're here, why don't you take that, and hey, why don't you take that? And the next thing you know, you've got 55-year-old men speaking on behalf of 23-year-old women. And I don't think that that is really the, um, really the best way to come up with decisions that, uh, uh, that support um, a, a, a really diverse, wide spectrum of membership. So, what what we did was we we uh, we proposed this to the um, at the national meeting in December. Uh, uh, the the national the national law and legislation committee agreed that this was a, a real issue that the USATF um, needs to tackle. So instead of just kind of rushing it through, we've now created a committee um, to really kind of vet particular issues and the, um, the real particular goals that we have of, 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 of this legislation. And I think the goal, and, I, and I'm on that committee, there's about eight or 10 people, and I think the goal here is this committee is really gonna make sure that we get it right, and then next year at their annual convention, um, create a really comprehensive bill that really addresses all these issues that, um, that the USAT, I mean, the USATF values diversity, and I think most institutions do, but it's just a question of how can we make sure that we're, um, you know, really embracing uh, diverse perspectives. Yeah, to your credit, that's outstanding what you did. It's a, it's like a natural evolution, progression where it needs to go. That's, that's awesome. That have also been in the the um, part of organizations where it's like the old boys crew making all the decisions, and yep. the young people try to come in. And then as soon as you try and not even change things, just come up with ideas that might be a little bit more efficient or might work well for a certain population, you pretty much get shot down because that old network is in there and you really can't change anything at all. That's fantastic. I like, give you props. Awesome job, Chuck. Well, you know, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like compelled that I also need to say that, 
you know, I feel like our organization has grown and has evolved and has, has developed the way it has, or club being the Garcia Track Club, because we have been open to people who come to the club who are just completely different than me or the people who are you know, running it and say, hey, what about this or what about that? And instead of shooting them down, like you just said, which I think is a natural inclination because your first thought is like, oh, geez, now we gotta you know, really rework everything that we've just been working on. You know, I think our club has done a really good job of being open-minded to new ideas and new perspectives. And, and uh, you know, we, we've made some significant changes over the years because of these diverse perspectives. And I think our organization has, has become much better because of it. So. Yeah. Your wife is quite the athlete as well. And, and a emergency room, okay. emergency room doctor? Uh, yeah, emergency room physician. Yeah, uh, yeah so we're, we're very different. Um, she's the, uh, you know, longer, you know, she loves doing marathons. She's um, qualified for the uh, uh, Ironman World Championships, I think it's five times. Um, so her typical training day is usually two sessions you know, three to five hours long, and you know, I'm, a, I'm an hour, <laughs> hour and a half, um, you know, at the most. So, um, you know, we're, we're very different, but we do try to find times to, to, to make it overlap. Like we'll go in, we have a, a same strength coach, so we'll try to do our strength training together, or if there's a day that we both have maybe just easy recovery runs, and she's not on the, you know, we'll do that. Or sometimes if, you know, if I'm really feeling up for it, maybe I'll join her on the bike, but I, you know, really try to avoid that at all costs. Um, but it is fun because this way there's always the right food in the house and we just kind of, you know, sleeping and all these things, we're really on the same page. So it's not like, um, you know, the, we don't have these competing interests of, you know, my wife wants to go dancing till three in the morning on Friday night and I want to, I want to go to bed early, but, you know, we're, we're, we're doing the same thing. So that's, that's nice. Yeah, nutrition is an interesting topic. What, are, are you in with any type of nutritional advice? Like, what, is there any certain diet that you follow? Uh, well, Lee has been great with that. Uh, you know, um, her background uh, in medicine has, has certainly played a role in terms of, you know, I mean, I, I thought you could eat ice cream three times a day, and evidently that's not the right way to go. But um, I, I, we did become vegetarian last year, and uh, it's, it's certainly taken a good amount of, of planning. Actually, Jason became vegetarian um, over the fall, too. Uh, it's taken a lot of planning, and it's taken a lot of uh, kind of reworking how we see, uh, you know, where we go out to eat and what we cook and, and things like that. But uh, I, I have felt a difference, and I'm not sure if there's been a huge difference with my performance quite yet. But, uh, you know, for Lee and I, it isn't just about times and places and medals, but it's, it's also just about living a healthy life and yeah, totally. enjoying what precious, you know, days and weeks and years we have. Sure. So, yeah. Jay, how's the vegetarian lifestyle going, sir? <laughs> I enjoy it. It's, it's it, as Chuck said, requires a lot of planning. Um, and, and that's really difficult, too, with, with balancing training, teaching, uh, coaching, having two kids. You know, some days if, if, if we don't uh, have our meal prep done and we run out of food, it's it's really hard to find something to, to buy yeah. that fits the diet. Uh, and, and I also I also believe in, in having cheat days too, sure. uh, just to keep the balance going. Yeah, I remember so, I was I was vegetarian for about a year and a half, and I was pescatarian probably for about six seven months during the summer. And I have a house down in Shore and Lavalette, and my niece and nephew love the kids. But they're like, oh, no, we're going to have friggin' <laughs> cod and friggin' asparagus again. Yeah, the entire summer. Yeah. If nobody wants to come over to the house to eat, they're just getting vegetables. Yeah. Speaking of nutrition, Ch Chuck has pioneered a drink. Uh, maybe you can tell us more about it. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a seltzer. Uh, does it grow hair? With a, uh, no, it, it does not. With a splash of lemon. I had to throw a joke in there. I'm like, yeah, yeah no, it's, it's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm serious to attend. <laughs> No, you really put a drink together? <laughs> oh, he's just kidding. I, I just, every time we go out, I have a, a seltzer and a little bit of lemonade. And, oh, that's pretty much yeah. it. It's the only thing I drink is seltzer. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. Totally. Love the bubbles. Yeah. I'm a bubble guy. No? 
plain water, coffee, and that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah, I like coffee a lot. Just a little bit. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Doc, anything you're saying closing? No, this is fantastic. I just want to encourage, uh, so can people just join Farm State Track Club, or is there like an initiation to get, in, in, do you have to get introduced into it, or can they actually just go to your website and sign up as, uh, as members? Yeah, there's no secret handshake, there's no ritual, there's no initiation or anything. Um, uh, I, I think the Garden State Track Club sometimes has a reputation of only being for competitive, fast athletes, but uh, that's definitely not the case. I mean, that may be the, the, the people that you see in the front of the uh, starting line, but you know, we really have um, an incredible spectrum of just incredibly great people um, of all paces and abilities and backgrounds. So, yeah, you know, just going on our website or emailing you know, Garden State Track Club at Gmail uh, and just, you know, inquiring about next steps and where you live and what you're looking for. Yeah, and, we're going to uh, post all your contact information yeah. on the website on the, uh, the podcast as well. Awesome. So if I join, uh, there's no hazing or anything like that? You're, you already have the haircut, so. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no hazing. Uh, what we probably do is just introduce you to, uh, we probably over, yeah, the, the hazing would probably be you getting overloaded with us emailing introductions to like a dozen people and you're going to be like, who the heck are all these people? And then they'll all write back and say, Welcome to the club, and who are you, and all that, and then, you know, hopefully you find time to respond to all of them. That's about it. Excellent. Chuck, anything in, in uh, yeah. closing here? Uh, no. No, I, I appreciate you all taking the time, and we appreciate you, you know, bringing our, uh, our esteemed Masters Captain Jason Tomachko here with us. Appreciate it. Jay, anything you'd like to say in closing? No, I'm pretty jealous that I have boots for this yeah. podcast, but... You'll but get to that level soon. Yeah. Well, one, one day, Jay. One, one day. day. One day. Yeah, get that soon. <laughs> Uh, Chuck, thanks for coming. Thank you. Really, uh, yeah. really good. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. If you'd like to you subscribe to our podcast on YouTube and iTunes, and please share it with your friends or anyone who may be interested in our content. Until next time, train your brain, train your body.